Hello everybody, today I put up a post on my Instagram page asking you all for your questions for me. This is the first Q&A I've done in quite a while, it's definitely the first of 2021, and I have to say, you all came out with some real brilliant questions. I have picked, more or less at random, 60 of them, and I'm going to do my absolute best to get through them as quickly, but also giving you a decent answer, as I can. So, paraphrasing the words of my good friend Scott from Ratarossa, uh, grab yourself a nice cold drink, sit down and get ready to enjoy. First off, from Ranky33, when am I going to review the Sapphire Cosworth? I have absolutely no idea. I don't really have much control of what cars are offered to me. I simply get emails from very generous people with nice cars and I'll say either yes or no and we'll see if something can be arranged. As you might imagine, I'm not really filming as much at the moment as I normally would be, but hopefully this year I will get the chance to film some more iconic classics and if a sapphire comes up, I'll certainly try and get it done. Next, from Car Mad Elliot. What annoys me most about the car scene and what enthusiasts have become? Well, Elliot, I don't think really true enthusiasts have changed all that much. It's just that people sometimes mistake idiots with cars for car people. A few years ago, when I started getting into YouTube and I had my Lotus, I did go to a lot of sort of car park meets, your very typical chavy Essex type things. And I was so frustrated because it would actually be very easy for us all to just get along with the police and the local authorities and everybody. And most of the first hour of these meetings was spent with people moaning, saying, why is it the police give us so much hassle? You know, we're not doing anything wrong. Ugh. And then 20 minutes later, someone would be doing donuts in a car park while some poor woman was trying to get a pushchair across the same car park. And then they're all sat there going, oh, why are the police hassling us? Like, well, because you're idiots. That's why. And that's what really annoys me. There's a lot of people doing just stupid things. I mean, you know, we've all been young. We've all done idiotic things that we may regret in some cases. But I think maybe there should be more effort put in trying to do stuff in a way that's not going to sort of antagonise the local community. I guess here in the UK, we don't have the luxury of having the sheer space of places like America. So we can kind of enjoy our fairly noisy habits without disturbing anybody else. And that, I think, is a shame. Uh, from James of Valhalla. Will I be disappointed if I get a naturally aspirated Devorah, not an S or 400? Well, I think if you can, try and get an S, or at least get the naturally aspirated one with the sports pack, with the shorter gear ratios. I don't think in performance terms there's really a huge leap between the S and the 400, regardless of what Lotus might claim. And in fact, there's a lot about the earlier cars that I really like. The way that they feel, the way that they ride, the handling, I think, is a little bit better on the earlier cars. The Evora is maybe a, a little bit better built, but then you could say the interior is not quite as premium. There's arguments for both. The NA is a fantastic car and actually you can free up quite a bit of power too. That engine does respond nicely to tuning so you can get another sort of 40 horsepower or so out of it. Have a look online, there's lots of information about it. Check out the Lotus forums and places like that for more information. But potentially, no. If you want a fast car though, yes, I think, especially if you get an early one with the long, long ratio gearbox in it, you may well be disappointed. A cheeky and cultured young chap called YC, who has a YouTube channel, asks how you stay professional on camera while wearing a moustache. I don't know. Just do it, I suppose. Champex. Have I ever farted in a car that I reviewed? These are not all brilliant questions, it must be said. I mean, probably. Which is my favourite Clarkson video or DVD, asks Jake MPS 6 Well, of course, it has to be Clarkson Unleashed on Cars, which is really his sort of first proper video and one that I still occasionally just put on in the background to watch because I absolutely love it. Really cracking thing. And the template for what Top Gear ultimately became. I, I, it's just a great video. It's got a bit of everything and it's a real pure nostalgia trip for me. Bradley M807 asks the best and worst thing about being a car YouTuber. Um, well, for me personally, I, I love the interaction. I love talking to people. I love being able to whinge and whine and discuss cars all day long. And, and people actually, you know, wanting my opinion on stuff. People asking me, you know, um, what I think about certain things. That's really, really nice to be able to talk to people. Um, and the opportunities that I've had in particular, the places I've gone, the cars I've got to experience. I think even if I made lots and lots of money in a sort of normal job, I would not have been able to have anywhere near as many of the experiences that I've had to date. And there 
there is hopefully a hell of a lot more of this to come ahead. Worst thing, uh, probably when you get people randomly asking the same question over and over and over, or people that will ask you, you know, your opinion on something that you haven't driven, or they'll ask you your opinion on stuff when you've done a review, um, you've already asked, answered the question, you know, in the video or whatever, um, that, that does get annoying. Um, the hateful comments as well, you know, the, the really nasty stuff you get in the comment section is, is not nice. I always knew it was going to be a part of YouTube, but that doesn't make it something that you enjoy. So there's that. Uh, Paul in hot 1971, uh, says 120 years of Cadillac. Is there much to celebrate? Uh, probably. I wouldn't be the person to ask about that, but but probably. I'm sure they've done some pretty amazing stuff. It's just I couldn't tell you about any of it. Uh, Jill O'Tin says, Money, no object. What would I daily? Oh, GTC for Lusso. Yeah, GTC for Lusso. Amazing car. I was down at Meridian not too long ago, and one of those just sort of just came past the V12 one. Even just at low speeds, what an amazing sounding and looking machine. That That's an incredible car. Now here's a great question from Danny Boy 11893 and he asks do I think the reliability focus of brands such as Lexus will matter as much in an age where everyone buys stuff on PCP that's a that's a great question isn't it I mean what's the point in building cars that will last 40 years if everyone chucks them in the bin after 10 I think it will help them stand out the used car marketplace for now is still quite important and I think you know people do care about that a lot of brands, I think, have gone too far with the whole quality cutting and cost cutting thing. And so even within that sort of first few years, you do experience problems. And even if, say, you're not having to pay for things to be fixed while you're in your sort of, you know, first warranty period, the car breaking down is still majorly inconvenient. So I think there is still an incentive for these companies to build cars better. I wish consumers would, you know, pay more attention to how well these things are, are made and put together rather than just getting something that's cheap because often it doesn't actually cost that much more to go and get a really well-made car. And Lexus is one of those brands that really we should buy a lot more of in the UK, but we just don't because we're obsessed with German stuff. Kieran Rubo, I believe, or Robbo, could be Robbo. Uh, which car do I dislike that is universally loved? Well, of course, the Abarth 595. Cheers. I got so much hate for that 595 video. It's hilarious. I think I'm going to do one every year, hating on the 595 for no reason in particular. Just to, just to wind up the owners' community. Eddie6505 asks, Is a TVI Carmera as a first sports car as bad an idea as people say it is? Ask yourself this. Can you work on cars yourself? If you can, then no, maybe you can get on with it because it is a fairly simple car. If you can't, I, I probably wouldn't. Depending on your driving experience as well, Chimera can be a, a pretty leery car, so be wary, I would say. Rick Wynn says his A35 AMG is broken. What do I recommend as a replacement? Well, Rick, I'd love to know what actually broke on your A35, because that's got to be a fairly new car. Now, the real question is, do you actually like the A35 or not? Because if you do, you're going to want something quite similar, in which case, Golf R, something like that. But if maybe you weren't so taken with it, you want something a little bit different. You could move into a saloon, in which case you go something like, you know, BMW M2, something like that. I mean, I'm not, not in love with it, but, you know, it exists. Uh, you could get something a little bit older, if you want something more interesting. E92 M3, go along those lines. Modern hatchbacks, the Civic Type R is absolutely amazing, super practical. Uh, the i30N is a good shout too. And, of course, you've got the GR Yaris if you want something a little bit wild. But it's not a very practical car. And if you've got the A35, the Yaris is probably a little bit too small hasn't got the space that you need in it. Uh, Luke Shaw says, with the Puma ST and Kona N on the way, what are my thoughts on hot crossovers? Uh, I still struggle to understand the crossover segment at all. I guess since the dawn of time, we've been building fast versions of inappropriate cars. I mean, the idea of a hot hatchback in of itself is just a, a stupid one. Um, you know, having a full fat V8 SVR Range Rover Sport is also a stupid idea. So, crossovers hot crossovers being a stupid idea i suppose shouldn't really put us off doing it but i i do just have to sort of sit and think do we really need this however i have recently reviewed a cupra ateca 
which may or may not be out by the time you watch this, but it's edited and it's done, and you'll see in that video some of my thoughts on that particular hot crossover. Tyler Baker 992 says, did I enjoy my Brera? And would I drive a more sorted 159 or Brera or Spider? You know what, actually, I did enjoy the Brera. There are a few really simple reasons I got rid of it. Uh, number one, it had too many problems for me to be able to sort within my budget. At uh, number two, it was very bad on fuel. Very, very bad. Number three, the space inside was absolutely awful. I mean, abysmal. With my seat in its normal driving position, the seat, the front seat, was was touching the seat behind. Absolutely no space in that car whatsoever. And it's the same size, basically, as the Alpha 147 I had at the same time. The same size as my 1 Series, the same size as, like, a Golf R32. And those you can get four people in, no problem. They're not the most luxurious of cars, of course, but you can get people in. The Brera, just unforgivably bad. And it annoys me so much, because it's such a good-looking car. And I would love, absolutely love, as a daily, a 159 Sport Wagon, because I think they're a great looking car, in the red, with the nice 19 inch wheels on, preferably with the 3.2 litre. I don't know if they even did many of those here. I think they did do it, but I don't know if anyone bought one. They're nearly all the 1.9 or 2 litre diesels. Um, so I'd love to drive some more of that type of car, the Spider, the Brera, the 159, because they're cool looking things, but yeah, deeply, deeply flawed cars. One of those real near misses from Alfa Romeo. Felix Page wants to know, what car did I learn to drive in? Well, there's two answers to that, really. Uh, first off would be the 1.6 litre, I guess it would be a 2005, 2006, maybe, uh, Ford Focus. A 1.6 ZTEC, I'm sure it was. Uh, I, I learned to drive with the AA, and that's kind of what they had. So if you learn to drive in the mid-2000s with the AA in the UK, you probably drove exactly the same sort of car. Uh, Glenn, my instructor's name was, XRAF, really, really cool guy. As soon as I got my license, the first car I really drove much was my grandmother loaned me her Vauxhall Astrovan, uh, which is actually still on my driveway. Um, and that is probably what I did my first sort of like, you know, few thousand miles of real proper driving in. Um, that was an experience <laughs> going into a van. Uh, I hope to maybe do a video one day on that van because it's very special to me. There's a lot of emotional sort of connection to that car. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's what I did a lot of my early driving in. Alex Frost says, can you enjoy a DB9 on B roads? Yes, you definitely can. In fact, it's way better on B roads than I thought it would be. Steering's delicious. Early car, suspension's a little bit stiff. Uh, later ones, it's a bit softer, but generally, wonderful thing. Seabridges1993 says, my thoughts on the Porsche Boxster S987.1. Great car. Love it. I know the engines have a reputation for going pop. Get it inspected, make sure it's a good one. Honestly, I actually prefer the early engines over the late DFI ones. It's got a lot going for it. Yeah, just do it, buy one, lovely things. Ed's White House asks an interesting one. This is one I get asked quite a lot. Uh, £10,000, one do-it-all car that's fun and interesting and something you could daily. And that's tricky because... Those things all mean something to different people. Like some people might absolutely need four seats, you know, as a daily, in which case you go either take a chance on a dodgy E46 M3, but then I don't like those. Uh, you get a Mark V Golf GTI, again, not really in love with it. Uh, I guess, can you get a 147 GTA? Like my buddy Jack at number 27 has. Um, that's an interesting, sort of, again, slightly flawed car. Um, bit of fun. Uh, 130i I do quite like as a sort of bit of an all-rounder. Um, that's, that's actually well within budget. Um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I'd probably be looking at. I mean, because, again, you, you could daily a, a Boxster. If you don't need the the, you know, the extra seats in the back, well, Boxster's got loads of space in it. It's comfortable. It's refined enough. Like Actually, it's a really, really nice daily. So, there you go. Sven Berners asks a, a similar question. 18 to 20,000 pounds, a 996 or a Cayman? Really depends on what you want. I love both equally. I would say if you're struggling on budget, get the Cayman because you're probably going to get a better car for less money. You know, that's the way it works. You're going to get a much newer car, much more spec for the same money. I got a massive soft spot the 996 C4S in particular, which a lot of people do. Um, but both great cars there. Drive them, see which one works for you because they're, they're actually they are similar, but crucially, they are not the same. Croc303 says, what, in my opinion, is the worst place to drive in the UK, be it a town or city? Uh, London. I used to live in London, and 10 years ago or so, it was actually not that bad. If you pick your time right, 
I used to go and see midnight movies in central London. I lived out in West London, uh, in Chiswick. And it wouldn't take me too long after the movie finished, you know, you're talking like 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, to just drive home. And it's a beautiful drive. The scenery in London is fantastic. You know, I really do love it in a lot of ways. Um, I had my Peugeot 407 then, my first car, which had a big panoramic roof on it. Occasionally I'd treat myself, I'd drive through Oxford Street actually, and just, you know, you get all the lights and stuff. Obviously at night there was no congestion charge, there was no um, ULES charge or anything like that back then. Um, and I'd love it. But now, so many 20 mile an hour limits, there's more traffic, they've actually shrunk the roads, put more cycle paths in, and they can't w work out why there's more traffic than there used to be. And it's just not a place I like driving. Um, that and Derbyshire, because Derbyshire police are, yeah, not nice. Hell.slow, which is the account for GF Williams, amazing automotive photographers, um, Lotus XCs that he has. And he says, am I going to do a lockdown haircut myself? It's getting quite close to that becoming a necessity. I was waiting last year, I was, my hair was growing out, I knew I did his haircut, but it was okay, because even if we were in tier three, the hairdressers were still open, so just before Christmas, I was gonna go and get everything done, then we got thrown into tier four, they all got shut, and so it's probably gonna be March now before I can actually get a haircut done, um, unless I get my hairdresser to agree to do a Zoom call, um, and I have to get, you know, there's a couple of family members that I have to care for, and I have to get one of those to cut my hair. Um, and I don't think that's going to go very well, to be honest. Um, okay, JKMSR7 asks, what car exceeded my expectations most that's been on the channel? That's a good one. Uh, and with the number of cars that I've driven, it's often very hard to think of an answer to questions like this. But I would probably say the XJ220, because... As excited as I was to drive it, it was more of a sort of you know, box-ticking exercise. Yes, I've driven an XJ220, but I thought it was going to be an absolute heap. I thought it was going to be awful to drive, horrible, because everyone's told you that it is. And maybe on track, compared to, say, like an F40, it probably is. But actually, on road, at normal speeds, I thought it was really nice. I actually quite enjoyed it. I really wanted more time with that car. Maybe that's something that will happen this year. Who knows? But, yeah, that actually yeah, blew me away. Really impressed with it. Harvey White, the, the best all-round car capable of going very fast and super practical that's not an Audi RS6. Alpina, either D3 or B5. There you go. There's a review of the D3 by Turbo coming out very soon. Have I, ever met, have I ever driven a car that was a case of don't meet your heroes on the channel? Ooh... The Lotus Esprit V8 actually was maybe something of a disappointment. I just, I didn't sort of get on with it, but I didn't really have that much time to experience it. Probably wasn't driving it in the right place. Um, actually, you know, no, never mind the Esprit. Aston DBS. Actually that, yeah, the Aston DBS. The gearbox and clutch are really not very easy to get on with, and the car is super, super stiff. Um, so actually, as a car itself, it's very disappointing. Um, so yeah, DBS is, is the one. The Sad Dog wants me to do a review of a Lancer FQ400 if I can. I will try, I have had an offer of a couple of those. Um, it's something I'm going to try and get done for this year. Uh, the Yam of War, interesting username, says when I'm not doing car stuff, what do I do to relax? Well, that's interesting because for the last few years, I haven't really had much time to do anything beyond car stuff. Uh, in the last sort of uh, month or two, I have had a bit more time, so partly by design, partly, you know, because it's been forced on all of us, uh, to sort of try and just ease off, relax a little bit more, just a little bit. My schedule is still very full. Um, and actually, I've been playing some video games where I can. I've been playing Cyberpunk 2077. That's been an interesting experience. The new Crash Bandicoot 4. Watching a lot of movies. Um, trying to talk with friends more. You know, getting in contact with people. Trying to do that sort of stuff. Um, try and work on myself a little bit. You know, improve life and, and that sort of stuff. You know, boring things. Um, listen to some more music and movies. Um, I've been sort of taking some of the money I've saved up by not traveling all the time to to spend on the house, um, try and do some things up, um, fix the cars, get things a little bit more ordered, you know, use it as an excuse to get all those jobs that, you know, I've been promising myself I'll do for ages, um, get those done. Um, 
in particular, I've been doing a lot of audio stuff. So I've got a new amplifier in here, which I love. Um, I've got a new amplifier in the in the lounge slash home cinema. I've got some new speakers and stuff coming. Um, and I've actually even done a few videos on hi-fi stuff because actually when I've mentioned it on Instagram and so on, people have said you know they're into hi-fi as well. So I'm actually going to branch out a little bit, do a couple of hi-fi videos just to mix things up a little bit on the channel. Um, it's not going to be a, a regular feature, but just something I thought would be interesting, you know, while we're all sort of sat at home bored, basically. Uh, DJW92, best all-round rocket ship for £15,000. Uh, be a fast golf of some sort, isn't it, really? I mean, that's just, yeah, done. Uh, could you get a C63 for that money? Because they were getting close to that money, the old W204, but I'm not sure you can. The Surrey Drivers Club asks, what is my guilty pleasure car? And that is a very good question. This is a Planet Hollywood mug from London, and it's ancient. This glass must be about 20 years old. I probably should stop using it and store it somewhere. Guilty pleasure car, Range Rover. I, I asked JLR um, just over a year ago. Uh, I had a few cars from them. I had a couple of Jags, and I said, you know what, can I have a full-fat Range Rover? They sent me this Range Rover Vogue. And because I hate Range Rovers, right? I hate Range Rovers with a passion because everyone that has one around here cannot drive to save their lives. You know, I'll be driving out in the Ferrari, they'll be in a Range Rover, and they'll expect me to sort of, you know, get in the potholes or in the mud or up the verge. They'll want to drive like two feet away from the curb in their Range Rover. And, you know, all the people in London that drive them that have absolutely no need of it, like, I just see it as like, it's just an oversized £100,000 handbag, is what it is. But you know what? As a car, actually, I really enjoyed it. Lovely to drive, nice place to be in, <laughs> really easy to drive, which is the most annoying thing because there's no reason for people to get it quite so wrong when they're out driving in them. And yeah, I, I really miss that car. They're having the, the huge amount of space in the boot, being able to just chuck my stuff in there. Like, yeah, I missed that car. That was one of the. That's one of the cars. If you ask me, like, which you know the press cars I've ever had that I missed the most, the Range Rover is probably up there. Uh, Julesy GTI says the best hot hatch of all time for the VAG group. Uh, it's got to be the uh, Club Sport S. That thing just blew me away. Absolutely sensational car. Far more exciting than I thought it could ever possibly be. Yeah, no hesitation on that one at all. Okay, so, uh, and from It Really Do Be Owen, I think, says, does the Ferrari 348 deserve the hate? Good question. I think when it was new, it probably did, because by all accounts, they had a lot of problems with handling, a lot of problems with quality, all sorts of stuff. Nightmare time, not a very good car, not very well made. But that was a long time ago. We're talking 30 years ago now, really. I mean, the, the youngest example was, what, 26 years old. So they've changed a lot. You know, tyres will have improved things. You can, you can set the geometry to a different way. You can do all sorts of stuff to really improve the cars. The one I drove actually was a really enjoyable car. I think the prices of them are getting a little bit too strong, and that's been driven by the fact that 355 prices and 328 prices sort of either side are quite high, so it just drags the 348 up, whether it's willing or deserving or not. But I think now the 348 really does sort of deserve, you know, it does deserve, I would say, some of the, the appreciation it's now being shown. So Watch Out uh, says, knowing that I'm a hi-fi guy, what is the best factory car audio system that I've ever heard? Uh, actually, I think, you know what? The Burmester in the, the Porsche Taycan Turbo really impressed me. I, I loved that system. I uh, didn't have too long to listen to it, but actually probably drove about an hour listening to the system. And yeah, it was great. Um, really, really liked it. Probably better than the name system, which costs about twice as much in the Bentley Conti GT. So there you go. Um, L Churchill 55 says, any plans to take the S2000 to the Nürburgring this year? Uh, don't really like the Nürburgring, certainly to take my own car around, not very keen on it as an idea. The S2000 is being built as a road car. That's not to say that I won't do it. The S2000 is not really going to be an ideal road trip car when I'm finished with it. So I need to work out what really I want to do with it. But um, I will hopefully be traveling and certainly going abroad this year. The Nürburgring is quite easy to get to, so it might make us on a natural stopping point. But I've no plans to take any of my cars around it for now. Paul30616 Valve says, Am I interested in motorsport? Rally, Formula One, World Endurance, WRX. Um, I really want to get back to a rally at some point. Um, I would like to take my Celica GT4 when it's done 
to the Wales Rally GB, maybe get it or stick it up, do the do the whole silly thing, you know. Um, I want to speak to Toyota about getting that done, if I can, if it's possible. We don't know, it might not be this year, who knows. But Rally GB is usually end of year, so fingers crossed. Um, I want to go to Le Mans. I've got plans, hopefully, to go to Le Mans this year. Again, if we're allowed and all that stuff. Formula One hasn't really interested me, hasn't interested me for quite some time. I mean, I was into it like 15, 20 years ago. Now, I couldn't name more than a handful of the, the drivers on the grid. Um, I, I really couldn't. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Scotty159 has a very interesting question. What are my thoughts on the Vector W8? Uh, he's always been a fan since Gran Turismo 2. A uh, weird, bizarre car. One of the strangest cars ever to actually make production, as limited as the production was. Uh, I, I'm just not really taken by it. But I'm glad it exists. I'm glad there are companies out there who think so madly, totally differently. And I do happen to know a guy that was involved with the Vector. A, driving a Vector would be up there on my sort of list of like automotive unicorns. Like I would love to be able to do that, but I just don't think it's probably ever going to happen because they're just so rare. I don't even know if there's anyone actually in the country. Jack the Car Nerd says, what's my favourite Ferrari apart from the 550 and the 355, obviously? Um, good question. Uh, the F50 I've always been quite interested in. The LaFerrari, I think it's actually a, a great looking car. Both of those quite unattainable, so not really um, very helpful. I actually really genuinely loved driving the 599. It actually really, really blew me away. And this year, hopefully, I'll be able to drive an 812, which I'm really looking forward to. The F12, I've always sort of had a real soft spot for. I think there's a few things about it I don't like. Like, it's got the single tail lights, where the 812's gone back to the sort of, you know, twin tail lights at the back, which to me is a really important sort of Ferrari styling cue. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed driving the Roma as well, actually. Genuinely, hand on heart, loved driving that car. Um, and all the other reviews of it seem to sort of echo my thoughts, which is, which is good. Um, so, yeah. That's a uh, um, that's a tricky one. The three sixty has really grown on me as well, actually, and the um, the four thirty as well. Uh, and four thirty, I'd actually genuinely consider as one of my next cars. Um, so there's a lot. I've not really answered the question, have I? Sorry. Um, I need more time with more Ferraris. <laughs> Uh, Harold111 uh, asks, "What do I think of the upcoming comeback of Bristol cars?" Interesting. I, I don't think Bristol's ever really known what it is, what it wants to be, and for that very reason, I'm not sure that they've never really found a way of succeeding in the past, so I don't see how they're going to succeed in the future, honestly. Uh, Dandro says, do I still have the 130i, and how do I find it as a daily driver? Um, it's good in some ways. The engine's great. Gearbox is great. Suspension's not great. Uh, I haven't got run flat tyres on it or anything, um, but it's just it's just it's not great and unsurprisingly the other day in the snow it was utterly and totally useless i know people mocked me when i said i bought it for winter daily i do have a set of winter tires to go on it but i'm also changing the alloys on it and those have been stuck in customs for like an extra two weeks so the snow has come and gone and my winter alloys haven't even gone on the car yet so that's very frustrating um but it's not a bad daily i'd say the r32 is probably the better daily driver more space more comfortable all wheel drive all that jazz Orange Calipers asks, BMW M2 or Audi RS3 as a first performance car? I'd say neither of those are a good option. If you have to choose RS3, just because it's more likely to sort of get you out of trouble. Um, the M2 is going to be a little bit more wayward if you want to be a total idiot with it. But honestly, both of those are really very fast cars. If you're inexperienced, you, know, you, you get into a hell of a big problem very, very quickly. Um, so maybe try and consider something else. You know, even like a, a 235 is still going to be a seriously quick car um, and deliver you a lot of the feel the M2 does. Neither of those cars really have great driving feel, so to me they're not particularly actually exciting performance cars. They, they're, just, they're just very fast. Maybe that's all that matters to you, in which case RS3, because it will drive, so you just stab it and it just goes. Uh, Jura Kovac says, um, what do I think Aston Martin will do to fix their problems? Uh, that is a subject for a video all of its own. Royston's Classic says, uh, 10 grand to buy any car for fun. What to go for? Even get a lease for that money, you kind of could do it. S2000 is a pretty good shout as well. You could have an MX-5 and sort of do a lot to it, really. Boxster, 
as well. I know I've said the box to, as an answer to a couple of questions before, but that's because it is really quite a good all-rounder and sort of very underpriced compared to a lot of other stuff. I know people will say there's a reason for that, but I'm going to be doing some box to content on the channel soon, so keep an eye out for that. And that's going to be of interest to anyone looking at doing the sort of you know cheap sports car route. JS Thompson says, ever thought about jumping into the van conversion trend? Seems everyone's doing it at the minute. Well, actually, I have filmed, and today, this very day, I've edited a video about a camper van. Uh, don't worry, I'm not really going to be a camper van channel because I don't really understand them. I don't, I don't know how they work, but I have done a video on one because why not? Michael Self 98 says EB3 or FN2 Type R is the FN really that bad compared to the previous model? Well, the, the way in which it's bad is it's very stiff. So it depends on the roads you drive. Uh, it's also a much newer car. EP3s now are getting very difficult to find in sort of reasonably decent condition. So, you know, that's a thing. Um, they're both good cars in their own way. Uh, Tartic Monkey says, Would I see the 130i as a spiritual successor to the clown shoe, the Z3M? No. No, it's, it's nowhere near as special as that. I mean, the, the Z3M is... is I know, I, I see what you mean, the sort of general shape of it, but... Nah, the, the you know actually the spiritual successor is probably more sort of the the Ferrari um, FF and, and Lusso. That's a closer I'd say in spirit to those cars. Uh, Thirteen all right says any cars I properly regret owning. Uh, maybe the seven series, which is gone now. That cost me a lot of money. Uh, I'm very glad that Joel, who has it now, uh, seems to have done quite well out of it with channel views. Um, but. Yeah, I had an Alfa Romeo that was a disaster. Uh, there's a yellow BMW I had as a track car that just never, ever got used. Have a look on my 30 cars or 29 cars by the age 30 video that I did a little while ago. And I'll tell you more about the individual cars and how I sort of felt about them. Uh, Gareth Littlewood, my opinions on the prices of the way old special Japanese cars are going. Uh, they're going bananas. I don't think it's going to be sustainable. They're about the only sort of semi-safe place to hold money in at the minute because a lot of the other traditional stuff is kind of just losing its money, your German stuff, all that sort of jazz. But right now, even the guys I know that are into these cars, they generally seem to think that they're all madly overpriced right now. There's still some reasonable value stuff, S2000, Celicas, that sort of stuff, but Supras, NS NSXs, things like that, they're too much money, way too much money. Andrew Shepard, 94, should I get a Cayman 987 or a 370Z or something else in that price range? They're both good options. Uh, they're both great cars, really, and it's difficult to do at the minute. You've got to drive them and just find out. Honestly, when people ask me questions like that, that's kind of the advice I tend to give. Like, I can only tell you what I feel. You may have a totally different set of requirements, experience, that's going to lead you to a different conclusion. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's why we have different cars in the world and different people buy them, because they have different requirements. So try them. They're two really good choices there. Now, Ted, Ted Tadmori has asked me a question, which a lot of people ask, which is, what's my favourite bit of British B-Road? And the answer is, I'm not going to tell you. I never, ever say... Sometimes it's obvious where I film, sometimes it's not so obvious where I film. I never, ever say where I'm filming, because I want to protect the identity of the people that, you know, that live there, you know, protect the privacy of those people. Uh, I don't want my favourite road to turn into the Evo Triangle and, you know, have people coming down to drive it and be absolute idiots. Um, I have enough issues with some of the people that bring me cars for review that I get very worried about the amount of noise or disturbance we create, especially if we are filming with some people still at home because, you know, you're going to be disturbing people in the middle of the day. And I just don't want to create any hassle or stress for anybody that I don't need to. And basically, I'm selfish. The good bits of road that I find, I want to keep to myself. So, sorry, Ted. Uh, Harry Rutland, best fun daily car, sub £20,000. And it's interesting that the difference between 10 and 20 grand, and even 15 grand, they're all very, very different things. And in fact, I may do a video, and I would like your suggestions down below. What categories of car should I do a video on? You know, maybe best five grand car or best 20 grand car. Like, what categories are important? Best four seater for certain money? Give me ideas, and I'll maybe do a video going through Auto Trader, Piston Heads, whatever, seeing what's up there. Uh, Jura Kovac, I think I've had, have they had them already? Don't know. Anyway, asks, what do I think about the new Subaru, Subaru BRZ? Haven't really seen much of it, so couldn't say. Sorry. Uh, Mitch AW says, money, no object. What one car would I do scandalous things for and why? Carrera GT. Just, do I need to explain? Uh, <laughs> Raz Redney asks, what's the thing about gravel driveways in England? In the US, they're mostly concrete. 
I don't know, actually, I've never really given it much thought, but now I think about it, you're right, we do like our gravel driveways, and Americans do like concrete ones. I'd quite like a concrete driveway, because, you know, um, yeah, it's weird. In fact, my driveway is basically concrete, but it doesn't feel like it, because there's so many loose stones on it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe someone can explain that. What is the deal with gravel driveways? Half my neighbours have got gravel, half of them have got concrete, so weird. Aaron Hussein, 4.7, says, my dream 60s American muscle car. It's, you know, it's a tough one, that, because I've driven quite a few of them. Uh, I think Camaro. I drove a really beautiful blue Camaro. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a 60s one. It might have even been a 70s car. They all drive more or less the same. I, they're all awful to drive. But that one looked amazing. And it sounded great. It had a manual in it, which didn't actually help it at all. But, yeah, go watch that review. I would happily have that in the garage if it was broken. I'd be like, yeah, look at that. Isn't it great? Here's a good one from Cars Are My Ting. Uh, what's your favourite car that never made it to production? I would love Lotus to have been able to make the Esprit they were supposed to after the Evora. Uh, this is not the Baha one, there was another Esprit. It was basically going to be spun off the Evora platform, and I know the ingredients that were going to make up that car, and it would, believe me, have been one of the greatest supercars ever made. Then just didn't happen. And here's one from a channel whose name I'm not going to say, or Instagram whose name I'm going to say. My theoretical build with favourite engine, transmission, body, interior, etc, etc, etc. Well, my favourite, so basically my perfect Franken car. It would be something with the body of a Ferrari 355, something with the engine of a Ferrari 355, something with the interior of a Ferrari 355, and the steering feel of a Lotus Evora. That would be my perfect car, I think. JP Carson 82 asks why he's suddenly become obsessed with the idea of buying a Porsche 944. I don't know, but I've also been stricken by this madness too. Uh, maybe there's a bug going around. We should probably be careful about that sort of thing. Uh, as if we aren't enough already. Okay, uh, Dave Dear Lejaka. I'm sorry, I made a mess of that. I don't know. Anyway, Dave says an automotive myth or stereotype which frustrates me. I hate this whole. Italian cars are always unreliable, German cars never break type thing because the truth is somewhere in the middle. Italian cars, of course, do go wrong, but also they can be a lot more reliable than people give them credit for. And German cars very much definitely break. It's one of these things. It's just a myth that's perpetuated and it drives me nutty. Harry Wheeler one asks, wants to know what my first car is. Go check out my 29 cars video history and you shall see, but it's not what you expect it to be. Uh, Anthony Rajwan says Ferrari or Porsche, all things considered. Uh, and this is interesting because it's not just the cars, it's about the brand and the dealers. And unfortunately on that one, I have to say Ferrari because Porsche at the minute, I'm not very impressed with. And I'm going to be filming a video on exactly why after I'm done with this one. Finally, from Gabriel Caramet or Carame, don't know, what's my favourite car from the 2000s? Oh, that is a tough one. That is a really, really tough one. I don't know. I just, I just don't know. There are so many cars out there, and I love them for many, many different reasons. So I will end, rather than answering the question, by asking it and saying, what do you guys love from recent times? In the last 21 years... What's come out? What's come out? Not just been on sale. What's come out? What's been released in the last 21 years that's really wowed you, really amazed you, you've loved, and you've, you've got to have one of those. There we go. That's 60 questions answered in just under 39 minutes. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.